Awo, shalom, Rastafari. Okay, let's let the smoke clear a little bit. Now, we've been on this point following up to some of our earlier postings concerning um, Libya, what we also labeled as the Red, Black, and Green Revolution, because what uh, Gaddafi did was suppress the real revolutionary spirit of, um, of Libya. Um, and in his bloodless coup, he drove out a, a good and a, a righteous, we would say more than good, uh, better than that, uh, a, a righteous king. And that was King Idris, King Idris. And, and enough has to be uh, um, um, brought back into the front and center. A lot is, is really not known um, by the majority of folks because a lot of even the Afrocentrics, you know, and this, this is a message also against that so-called false Afrocentricity and Pan-Africanness. You see, there's a false and a counterfeit form of Pan-Africanness that actually is in bed with Gaddafi. Now, I can't really figure out whether it's because of ignorance or, or mis- and disinformation or are or, or some, some of these folks really knowingly, and they know exactly you understand what they are doing. You understand whether they know what they really are doing. So we'll leave that judgment to job. But what we are discussing right here is the the metaphysical the metaphysical irony of the fact that on the very same day that Gaddafi gets his comeuppance, mm -hmm, on the very same day that he gets his comeuppance is for us as Hebrews and as Jews, black Jews in particular, and even the other Jews, the very day is, is a holy day known as Simchat Torah. And Simchat Torah means joy of the law, joy of Torah. And when we study the metaphysical connection of Gaddafi with Haman and with Amalek, you understand, and with Edom and with Esau, and with Agag and the Egyptian Apep or Apophis and the Hyksos, it becomes very clear. It becomes very clear who's who on the face of the planet Earth. Now, we say we're going to touch on Apep or Agag. The uh, Pep from Egypt is the Agag in the Bible. And in the Greek form, it's known as Apophis. Apophis. Now, the Hyksos, the, when the Hyksos... Um, took over and persecuted the native, the native rulers. You see, this is like Africa was black people. Uh, Libya in ancient times was black people, where black Arabs, black African people were in that region. We don't see that today. It's like Egypt. If you look at modern Egypt, and these people say they're Egyptians, but they're not ancient Egyptians. This is why they are totally ignorant and they are separate from that cultural heritage you understand? They just use that for, for tourist dollars and to attract people and to make money. And what they do is exploit our ancestors. You understand? The ancestors of black people basically digging up our ancestors, disturbing their resting places, you know, grave robbing. This, and, and, and see the Arabs and the, the pale red and Mohammedan Arabs and Ishmael has been doing this for quite some time. And Ishmael and the pale red Arabs, they are the last of these conquerors of our land and our territory. Now, when we see uh, Gaddafi, Gaddafi, in a sense, is very unique in this whole picture. Because, see, in Gaddafi, we can see the true nature and the true hypocrisy, as we quote it from their law, from their law, the Quran. You know, the Quran says that the desert Arabs, is, 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 is the greatest hypocrite, you understand? So there's a lot of, of um, strange things still to come from that region, from that region of the world. But in order to get the change, the process of change and the chains, you understand, in motion, that had to happen. And like we said, we stood out about that. We said that this revolution is going through. For such and such reasons, Gaddafi was an enemy of his majesty, was the enemy of true Pan-Africanism. A, a lot of our own so-called um, black folks over here, 
you understand, who think they know something, but they're totally ignorant. You understand, Gaddafi was an enemy. He was an enemy of his imperial majesty. Gaddafi was an enemy of his imperial majesty and an enemy of Pan-Africanism. Even in the Libyan equation, look what he did. He drove out the revolutionary king who drove out the Italians and the Europeans and the fascists and the colonizers. He, that King Idris drove them out. King Idris was one of the early um, Pan-African leaders who fought alongside his imperial majesty and other revolutionary African leaders to break the yoke of colonialism and European imperialism on Africa. Then Gaddafi comes along, and what does he do? He comes up in a bloodless coup, you understand? But his, the entirety of his years would be bloody, would be bloody, you understand? And it surprises me as a so-called persecuted people, speaking to the, some, of the, some of the Afrocentric um, red, black, and green waivers over here, that they don't recognize that. They would be in support of Gaddafi when what Gaddafi did, he even destroyed the banner of that nation, the red, black, and green flag, and just put the green, which represents his own tribe. So he was not a unifier. You understand? But he was an exploiter, a liar, a decepticon. He would say one thing uh, publicly, but privately he was in bed with the West. And this is why a lot of them was it, it took the West a, a, a couple of weeks to really get so-called on the right track because public opinion. See, public opinion, you know, was out there. And even the Arabs, the other Arabs, the Arab League, they made certain decisions, and, and, the, and the United Nations as well. So on one level, their hand was forced. I, I, I do think Obama recognizes, you know, what the real deal, you understand, is with that region of the world, but he had to allow certain things to go through. And we also want to give due credit to um, um, UN Ambassador uh, Susan, Susan Rice as well, who, like Condoleezza Rice, is a type of a black Esther. Now, some folks might not get it. Some people will think, oh, uh, how could you say that? She's Uncle Tom, so forth and so on. Uh, you see, you, this is the reason why black folks are in the situation they're in. This is why 40 years later, things are not even better for black folks, really, on, on a real deal. A lot of that that happened, you thought people were, something had changed, and, and now you look at the rate of black poverty in America and disenfranchisement, and it's probably at the same or higher level than it was nearly 40 years ago. It's a farce, it's a sham, because the preachers and the pastors don't want to tell this black people who they really are as the once lost but now found beta Israel. That's the long and that's the short of the whole story right there regarding this people in the Americas and the Caribbean. But once you come into that consciousness and you recognize your identity and who you are, then it becomes very clear well, who everybody else is. It's a matter of study. It's a matter of meditation. It's a matter of reasoning. It's a matter of accepting what the truth is and not to try to change it to please you understand, some PC perspective, be politically correct, and the world, this, this, this seclorum is going to hell in a handbasket. You see, it's only the truth that will preserve our true life, both in this world and especially in the world to come. So let's touch on a pep. Let's touch on a pep rule. Mm -hmm. Now, this will be perhaps the last part of, of this particular um, matrix here. But this still, this connection between the Simchat Torah, right, the connection between Simchat Torah and the day on which Gaddafi was killed by his own so-called people whom he persecuted. You see what I'm saying? He persecuted those people for 40 years. He disenfranchised those people for 40 years. He stole wealth from those people for 40 years. You know what I'm saying? And he was an enemy of his imperial majesty. And he's one of the, one of the significant individuals still in power today that helped to reverse the progressiveness of Africa. He's one of that younger generation 
basically, that like Decepticons, people thought they were about something, but actually what they were really about were about war, bloodshed, deception, and, and, and one of the biggest con games in history. Because when you look at Libya, you see very little infrastructure. There's no even democratic so-called systems there. You understand? Even the religious Islamism in, in that country, he, he oppressed. So how can our so-called lost sheep people, these so-called Afrocentrics, you know, lament and weep and mourn for Gaddafi? Something else is at work here, and we, and we need to check it out. But now on a pep or the, a gag connection, a gag, A-G-A-G, -A -G. who was a gag? And what does a gag's name really mean? Well, first of all, a gag means violent. A gag means high. A gag means warlike, and a gag means flame. That's what the meaning of Agag, A-G-A-G. -A -G. Now, remember, we are, we've been making this connection between who's who right here. Now, Agag was king of the what? Amalekites. He was king of the Amalekites according to 1 Samuel 15, verses 8 to 33. Now, metaphysically speaking, now in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, there's a short definition here for Agag. You know what I'm Because the real long definition or info, you have to connect a gag, A-G-A-G, -A -G, to the Apep, A-P-E-P, -P, who is the Apophis, to really see what this metaphysical and spiritual force known as a gag is. Now, metaphysically, it says the adversary, the ruling ego of the adverse, carnal consciousness in man, the carnal consciousness that's in man, hence violent, warlike, and flame. Now, when you go to Agagite, one who is an Agagite, this means belonging to Agag. It's like saying an Apepite, one who belongs to, for lack of a better word, the serpent or the Satanist party. Now, they say in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary that an Agagite is the same as an Amalekite. So we see the link between these two. Now, Haman, Haman, the enemy of the Jews and the Hebrews, the black Hebrews in Persia, he was an Agagite. Now, it tells you that the metaphysical see Agag and see Amalekite, and we have seen that in the earlier, in the earlier portion of this. But what we want to do right here on this connection with um, Muammar Gaddafi is to go to our scripture, go to the Bible, right? And we want to go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Let's go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and let's find out the wisdom, the wisdom that's there. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And now chapter 15, we're going to focus on verses 8 to verse 33. Verse 8 to verse 33. Now, here it says that Saul, right, who was the first king of Israel in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, as we mentioned before, mentioned again, that if one can't afford to get the book, they can go to our site. There's much freeware and, and, and shareware there that they can download some of the PDFs of the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary as well as the, the Schofield um, reference in the Study Bible. They can use this on their computer. They can use on their tablet, on their smartphones, and can utilize this to study and to, um, and to grow. You understand? To grow in the knowledge of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. Now, here in the Schofield Study Bible, it says, Saul's incomplete obedience. And they say, compare with Genesis 11 and 31. So let's just go there right now and compare with Genesis 11 and 31 and see what 1131 is talking about in this connection with Saul and his incomplete obedience. Here, the incomplete obedience, the wasted years at Haran. And here it says, And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife. And they went forth 
with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. Right? And then right here, 32, they said that they dwelt at Haran. Haran. And the days of terror were 205 years. 205 years. And terror died in terror died in Haran. But now there's a note here concerning the incomplete incomplete obedience and the the wasted years. There were wasted years at Haran. Now when I look at this, I'm just I'm just thinking about um from the nineteen uh statesman of the OAU and the great works that were going on in Africa during the visible reign of Ketamawi Hala Selassie, and then just looking over the past um, 40 years, 40 years later, mind of the Israelites in the wilderness, they could have gone in and possessed the land, but instead they believed the false witnesses. See, there were some false witnesses who came back giving the Israelites bad reports. And I see this as a as so-called pan-Africanist, Afrocentric community, especially those who don't want to call a spade a spade and really recognize that Gaddafi was no revolutionary. He was not a positive influence in Africa. In fact, he was a Decepticon. He was basically one of the biggest Decepticons. And this is why the West was so hard-pressed to really let him go. But his continual craziness and insanity forced their hand. You understand? Forced their hand. He could have adopted a different a different approach. He could have left. He didn't have to end up the way he ended up. But once we break down, as we broke down in the Sabbath of our core, that connection between Amalek's son, Haman, and Gaddafi, and you can go look at that video and the other videos from that period of time. And see, as we did each video, we began to see more and more how this would end for Gaddafi. And, 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 and um, this affected us because we really kind of saw what happened in spirit before it happened. And at one point, we almost were disobedient not to put that video out because we said, oh, man, you know what happens to Haman? Not only do Haman get hung, you understand? But his sons also get hung. And now look what happened in the sense that they got killed, not hung, but look what happened in the sense of Gaddafi and his sons. But then we have to ask ourselves, well, we think that's so bad. Oh, look what he did to Gaddafi. How many people did Gaddafi murder? You understand? And, and then he also hired um, very low-life so-called Africans, ones who could... Who, who would take money to kill somebody else's people, you see? And this is part of the problem that's going on. So if we look at what's happening in Libya, and they have some black guys there who they're accused of, um, you know, being um, mercenaries, maybe some of them are innocent. Maybe they are. You understand? But many, we know, are not innocent. And see, they, many of the careless Ethiopians are in bed with that too. Look, just look at what happened in Lampedusa. Lampedusa is one of the islands off of the coast of Italy where a lot of the people when the war really broke out, they got on ships or whatever could float and try to get out there and try to go into the, to, to Europe and claiming, oh, we refugees, we need help, so forth and so on, as though people must let them in. It's almost like somebody knocking on your door of your house and saying, listen, I got nowhere to live, please let me in. You got more than me. And maybe you don't got a lot, but you got a little bit more. Must you open your door and let them in? You see, how come all these people are coming from African countries and nations? Why don't they build up their own country? People say, oh, because they got bad people in leadership. Well, why do they fight a revolutionary war? Do what you got, do what you got to do. You understand? See, they're shaming the black race. You know, just shames the black race. Because they, they perpetuate the white supremacist stereotype that these niggas can do nothing without us. Look at them. Look at these niggas. They can't even run their own countries and governments, so forth and so on. And we know that's not true. You know what I'm saying? We know that that's not true in its essence. But that's how this, this nightmare, this horror story that we're viewing right now, but it's the end. We see, we're coming to the end of this, brothers and sisters. 
we're in a time of change, change that goes beyond the so-called, uh, you know, the, the, the demiurges, you know, the, the petty rulers of Babylon and, 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 and these ones with their schemes and conspiracy. This, this, is, a big, this, this is a big thing. You know, we're, we're in big times, my brothers and sisters, but we got signs on earth and we got signs on heaven. We say, what is the government doing? What is this one doing? And what is that one doing? And looking at all these conspiracy theory videos. But what are we doing? Even if the only thing we can do is to study and show ourselves approved so that in spirit, soul, and in body, we will be prepared. Many are not even doing that. But the brothers and sisters out there who have taken up this, 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 good, this good, making their wills obedient to good influences, I and I love you because we know that you love studying our Father's Word, and we give thanks for you. Now, let's, let, let's get into Samuel right here, Samuel chapter 15. Here, it, it, this is a section where Saul's incomplete obedience, and it, and it mentions some very important things in this chapter. This is the same chapter which says to us that, um, that rebellion, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of Yahweh. He hath also rejected thee from being king. This is what happened to Saul, the first king of Israel. Now, let's begin from the top. It says, Samuel also said to Saul, Yahweh hath sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now, Therefore, hearken thou to the voice of the words of Yahweh. Thus saith Yahweh Abba'ot, the Lord of hosts. I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. Ah, so here's the connection. What Amalek did to Israel. Let me ask you, brothers and sisters. What did Amalek do to Israel? What? Do we know? See, so if we are right, and we are based on all the evidence in assigning that, that spiritual character and nature of Amalek to Gaddafi, then what did Amalek do to Israel? And who would be, if Gaddafi is that Amalek type, then who would be Israel? Well, Israel, in its African sense, would be that throne of David, that African Zion in Ethiopia, and would be represented in the person of Moa and Bessel, Imma, Negeda, Yehuda, or the conquering line of the tribe of Judah. Kedamawi, Haila, Selassie. So you make Gaziawi, Nugusa, Negeza, Ethiopia. But Gaddafi would have the audacity to even sit up in Addis Ababa, you understand, in the OAU or the African Union Hall and allow himself to be called King of Kings of Africa. You see what that shows us? That shows us there's a lot of other guys that need to either be voted out of office, you understand, or taken out of office, you understand, even if necessary, by righteous force. That's all it shows us. You understand, there's a lot of traitors up there. There's a lot of traitors up in that peace there. Now, it says, thus saith Yahweh Tabaot, the Lord of hosts, the power of the Trinity. I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. I remember how he laid what? Wait for him in the way. He laid wait. He laid in wait like a hijacker. He lay wait in the way when he came up from Egypt. So when the beta Israel came out of Egypt. Amalek was like a, a hijacker. Amalek was like a, 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 a pirate, you understand, a shifter, a, a bandit that laid in the wait to do what? To hurt and destroy the Hebrew, even the black Hebrew, Judeo-Christian, Ethiopian people. Now go and smite Amalek. This is what Yahweh said. Yahweh said, go and smite him. Go and done him. Go and smite Amalek and utterly, completely destroy all that they have and spare not. So here in the twenty in the twenty first century, we get our first example of what this century probably is going to be like. You understand? As the reverses of the curses are coming to pass. You understand? This is what happened to Gaddafi. 
You understand? It said, go smite Amalek. So smite Gaddafi. Smite this type of terrorism, this homegrown terrorism. You see, but there's other links to Gaddafi. You see, he, he spread a lot of money around. A lot of people are very upset right now because they're not getting their gubo. You understand? They're not getting their bribe money, their hush money. You see? Even some, some of these ones and ones over here, who knows? You understand how deep the rabbit hole goes? They're not willing to be unplugged from this. They are even lamenting for Gaddafi. You understand? But who laments for Gaddafi's victims? Both the victims in Ethiopia, the, the Ethiopians who are victims of Gaddafi's treachery, or even the, some of the Libyan people who are victims, or even the other so-called Jews who were victims too. They were non-combatants. That's how you're going to do. You're just going to attack anybody you can get to. You understand? Know the see soldier there. The attack soldier there. No, you don't want to attack soldier there. You want to attack old people. You want to attack women and children. That's what you want to do. So Yahweh says, go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spear them not, but slay both man and woman. Boy, infant and circling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now, see, here's something very interesting. It's like in the army. What, what that right there was, and, and, and in the army they call that, that was like the order. That was like an order. You understand? That was like the order that was given. That's like the mission right there. That was the mission for Saul, for, for Saul. You understand? To remember, Yahweh said, I remember what Amalek has done. You understand? I remember what Agag and Apep have done in the Apophis and the Hyksos and, and Esau's Edomites and his funny mixed multitude confederacy that included Canaanites, that included Ishmaelites and all the rest. And this is who those people, this is, this, this is a part of the racial identity as well. But we're looking at this spiritually for now. You understand? He says, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now, we live in a very PC time right now. So, you know, that would seem like, oh, my goodness, they're going to kill everybody, everything. Why is this? You see... Yahweh is righteous and is just. His mercy endure forever. But to those who have no mercy, just like Gaddafi said, no mercy for those people. You understand? He would have no mercy on those people. This is why when Obama and the said they were trying to prevent an imminent slaughter and a massacre, I, I'm hard-pressed to see some of these black um, African-American leaders and so-called pan-Africanists, you understand, who are out there, lamenting for uh, Gaddafi as though something wrong happened. What about the victims? What about the Ethiopian victims, the Libyan victims, even some of the so-called other Jewish victims, the African victims? You understand? What about those victims? So you're going to feel all these tears for this one man who, who lived lavishly, lived lovely. He could indulge in every vice. You understand every vice that he wanted had a gold gun. I mean, I mean, what sense did that make? Remind me of um his buddy, um Saddam so damn insane, Saddam Hussein. He also had a gold rifle too. You overs, but you see some Negroes, even though they're Afrocentric, they still are worshiping the golden calf. They still are worshiping the bling bling. Mm hmm. They may be against the white man, white man, but they themselves have not become the right man, right man. You understand? So not dealing with righteousness. So now, verse 4 says, And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Talayim, in Talayim, 200,000 200, footmen, 200,000 footmen, and 10,000 men of Judah, and 10,000 men of Judah. Verse 5 says, And Saul came to a city of Amalek. He came to one of Amalek city and laid wait in the valley. And laid wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, 
go depart, get you down from among the Amalekites. He gave the Kenites, for some reason, he gave the Kenites. Now, the Kenites are a very interesting group as well. You understand? Put a warn order on them. We need to have a warn order on, on the Kenites, scripturally right here. But now, he goes and warns. Remember, Yahweh said nothing about warning no Kenites. But he warns the Kenites that go depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. So he's already telling them, you understand, what he's going to do, which means that some of them probably already might have warned, you understand, in the message that, oh, the Israelites are coming, you see. So this is an example of, of, of incomplete obedience right here. Lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt, so the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Well, you know, that, that, that's very interesting that he, he, he said that, you know, he, you know, but still that wasn't a part of the worn ord. You understand? The worn ord. The, 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 worn, the warning order that wasn't given as part of the main order. You see? So let, let's see how this plays out. Verse 7 says, and Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah. Make a note of that. Havilah, because Havilah we find in the beginning with where it speaks about the rivers coming out of the Eden to water the garden, and it mentioned Ethiopia, and it mentioned Eulat or Havilah as well there. So it says that Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to shore. Now see, shore, that is over against Egypt. That's over against Egypt. So what we have here is Saul going as far, it seems like, even penetrating to a certain level, Egypt. This is where the Amalekites were spread out, you understand, know, over this particular particular territory. Now, verse 8 says, And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. So now he takes the king alive, who is... The, a pep or a god, right? He takes the king alive, but he smites all of the people. But Saul and the people spared a god. Was is that what Yahweh said to spare a god, spare a pep? Now remember what we said that the Hyksos um, subjugation of the native rulers of Egypt it began off an a pep or uh, pepper, you know, a certain king named a pepper. If you study Egyptology, it began with a pepper, and it ended with a pepper. But now, um, linguistically speaking, a gag, A-G-A-G, -A -G, is a pep, A-P-E-P, -E -P, which in, the, in the, the Greek is Apophis. And so a gag was, was, was king of the Amalekites, as, as the pep was king of the Hyksos. So you, so you see what we, we now understand, that picture is becoming clearer to us in the Israelite involvement in true ancient history is also coming to light. So it says, Then he took a gag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared a gag, and the best, he spared a gag, right? And the best of what? Of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlands, and of the lambs, and all that was good. This is almost like the tree, you know, when we get back into the Genesis. You remember that when Eve looked at the tree, when the, when the serpent did the gender bending on the tree first, it was a he tree. Then in the language, you can only understand this really in the Ethiopic and in the Amharic and the Royal Amharic Bible of His Majesty, that the gender of the tree changes. You understand? Because she speaks of the tree as a he tree. You understand? Eve, Haywan. But then the, the Ibbab, the Ibbab, because Ibbab also connects with the, a pep as well. You know, the Ibbab, which is to say Ethiopically on them, Hark the serpent, said she, refers to the tree as she. When that happens, then in your Bible it says, and then the tree became desirous for food, desire. Now desire is a factor that plays with the Amalekites and this whole personality type. One example of it is, is the lust factor. Now desire, in its essence, is a good thing, desire. But the desire must be kept in certain righteous and moral bounds, you know, bonds and bounds. You know, was, in other words, under discipline, especially discipline of the mind. Now, Saul and the people, it says, he has spared the God, the king, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, of the fatlings, of the lambs, and all that was good, and would not, and it says, and he would not 
utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, in other words, all the stuff that needed to be destroyed anyway, he destroyed. It says that they destroyed utterly. You see that? They didn't do a complete job. And this is one of the reasons why we still are battling these forces even to, to this day. When you think about this and you start to study that, Yahweh said do this, but somebody got a bright idea and went against the word of Yahweh after Yahweh had done so much for us. Still, they went against this. Remember, this is not just reading the Bible and seeking to interpret and understand that context, but Yahweh was speaking directly, you know, saying, through his prophets to the people. Yovas. Then came, verse 10, the word of Yahweh to Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and have not performed my commands. It says commandments are really the command that he gave him to smite everything, don't spare nothing. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried to Egeziah, he cried to Yahweh Baruch Hu all night. All night, Samuel, he cried. You understand? Because he's the one that went forth and anointed this one. And now Yahweh told him that this repented him. You understand? This repented. He changed his mind about this one right here. Because this one right here is not doing his will at all. So verse 12 says, And when Samuel rose up early to meet Saul in the morning. So Samuel rose up early to intercede to meet, Samuel, to meet Saul in the morning. It was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel. Carmel. And behold, he set, up, he set him up a place. And is gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. So Saul is just traveling around. Probably he was handing out some of that sheep, that oxen, that 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 the, the goat, the stuff that he got. You know, like bribe stuff. Something like what Gaddafi would do in a sort of a sense. So we're not comparing Gaddafi to Saul, but the nature of disobedience is still the same. Now Saul came. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said. To him, blessed be thou of the Lord. Blessed be you of Yahweh. I have performed the commandment of Yahweh in verse 13. Can you imagine this? After he clearly didn't but chose all the good stuff to keep and the bad stuff which needed to be destroyed, he destroyed. Can you imagine this? He says to the prophet of Yahweh, to the prophet of Jah, he has done the will of Jah. Can you imagine? He could just say, how you doing? What's up? You understand? But he actually says he's done the will. Now, Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them. Now, notice what Saul is doing. Saul is doing in a similar sense what Adam did in the garden. Instead of Adam owning up for his disobedience, he blames Jah. He blames God. He says, The woman which you gave me. She gave me to eat. So he blames Jah. He blames Elohim, Baruch Hu, and his woman and the wife. This is why we have to man up. You know what I'm saying? Man up. You see, Adam did not man up. And here Saul did not man up. Samuel is catching him in a lie. There's a movie, one of, one of Richard Gere's good movies. Well, at least a movie I personally, I, I, I like it. Even though, of course, it's mostly whitewash and stuff and the characters, who's playing who. But as far as the movie, it's pretty enjoyable. It's about King David. I don't know if you've seen, there's a movie out about King David. And it begins, actually, with this particular scene. It begins with this scene right here where Saul, um, you know, where Saul uh, uh, says, you know, to, to Samuel. Samuel comes along and, 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 and Saul's talking about, you be blessed of, 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 of the Lord. And I perform the commandment of the Lord. And then Samuel says, what? Meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Question. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord thy God. Notice what he says. He didn't say the Lord our God. He says to the Lord, to Yahweh, thy Elohim, Eloheka, and the rest. We have utterly destroyed, and the rest. What was that? Was that the order? Was that was that the order that that he was given? 
No, it wasn't. But here we can clearly see that Saul, as the king of Israel, is not manning up and taking the response. He's blaming the people. Oh, the people did this. Oh, it was the people's fault. You know what I'm saying? They wanted to sacrifice this to the Lord thy God. Not the Lord our God, but the Lord thy God. You see what the sacrifices was in old Israel? Let me explain it to you simply, black people and other people as well. The sacrifices in Israel, when they talk about all the animals, that was a BBQ. Yes, that was a barbecue. That's what the sacrifices were. So, not, you, you see, when they said, oh, we want to sacrifice the Lord thy God, so forth and so on, they also want to eat some, some of that food they get to eat as well. This is what they want to do. They want a big barbecue. And the fact, the Old Testament sacrifices on a certain level was just like the picnic and barbecue in the sense of what happens to animals and how people eat and the smoke go up and so forth and so on. That's what it was. That's why he says that there'll be a new, you understand, a new and a true sacrifice, one that's of, of, of spirit and one that's of fire. Mm-hmm. This is why the chalice, you understand, the chalice of the true Rastafari is the chalice of the true Rastafari. He says he won't drink of it until he drink of it anew, right, in the kingdom with I and I and I, with I and I and I, right? Now, let's go forward right here. So now what does, um, what does uh, Samuel, Samuel said to Saul, verse 16, stay? He says, stay here, stay here, stay. And I will tell thee what Yahweh hath said to me this night. And he, speaking of Psalm, uh, Saul, said to him, Say on, speak, speak on it, speak on it. Verse 16, Then Samuel said to Saul, Okay, and, and Samuel, Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, when you were still a, a, not a big man, when you were still um, a, a, a small boy, when, when you were a small boy, when you were a small boy, when thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? Wasn't you anointed and made the head of the tribes of Israel while you were still a small boy? Right? And Yahweh and Jah, if you please, anointed the king of Israel, anointed you king of Israel? And Yahweh sent thee on a journey. He sent you on an errand, a mission. He sent thee on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Fight against them nonstop until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of Yahweh? In other words, why didn't you obey the voice of Yahweh, but this fly upon the spoil? You, you, you flew upon the little goodies. You, you saw something of value there, and you went after it. And this evil in the sight of Yahweh. And, you, and by doing that, because he went against the command. You see, when he got the command, he didn't say, well, so, you know, I might want to. No, he basically agreed. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. But then he goes, he does it, and he blames the people. He says the people want to do it for your God, Samuel, for the Lord, for Yahweh, Eloheka. You know what I'm saying? Not, not, not Eloheinu, not ours, but Eloheka, your God, not our God. N notice that right there. These little things, when we study, you begin to see even the psychological nature. You know what I'm saying? Like, to the psychological nature of the beast, of that lower consciousness level. And Saul said, and, 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 and Saul said to Samuel, Yay! He said, Oh, I have obeyed the voice of Yahweh, and have gone the way which Yahweh sent me, and have brought, notice that key word, I have brought Agag, king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalek Awiyan. Is this nigga mad? Wasn't the warn, wasn't the order, wasn't the order, you know what I'm saying, wasn't the order now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Wasn't that what they were told to do? Mm-hmm. Wasn't it? 
Isn't that what it said? But now notice the arrogance and the resistance to the truth of, of Saul. Notice that, of Saul, where he says he has done that, but he's brought a pep. He brought the king of the Hyksos, known biblically as Amalek. You understand? Amalek. Because the Hyksos is the Egyptian-derived term, Hekshos, Hekshaw. You understand? Well, Amalek is going back to their ancestor. So that's how the Israelite knew that we know who your ancestor was. You know what I'm saying? That's how we refer to you by your ancestral name, and you refer to us by our ancestral name of Israel. You know what I'm saying? And that's how that's how that's how it goes. So this don't make a confusion. A pep, you know what I'm saying? A pep is a gag, and Amalek is the Hyksos. This is the half of the story that's being revealed in this time. Now it goes on and it says. Um, but the people took, he, he now says, but the people took, he want to blame the people, he's king, right? But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, and the chief things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Why is not Saul saying to the Lord our God? Why is he standing outside of that? Because in consciousness, in his consciousness, he was standing outside that. He wasn't embracing Yahweh as Eloheinu, you understand, as our God. Instead, Samuel is the prophet. So he's doing this almost like to pay Samuel in a sense off. But watch what happens next. Watch what happens next. And Samuel said, Hath Yahweh, has the Lord, has Jah, if you please, as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of Yahweh? In other words, does Yahweh have, have, have a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Or really, does he have more delight in obedience to his voice and the voice of his prophet? Behold, look and see. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken to hear to hear than the fat of rams, than the fat of rams. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of Yahweh, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Verse 24, and Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. Now, 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 now he's getting religion, as they say. Now he's like, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of Yahweh and thy words and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He obeyed whose voice? The voice of the people. This is where we get the, the, the Latin phrase, vox populi, vox dei. You see, that means the voice of the people, the vox, the vox populi of the populace. Vox is the voice of Dei, or the Deo, deity, is the voice of God. But that's not, that's not what, we, what we believe. That's not what we hold as true. We're just saying that's what many say, that the voice of the people is the voice of God. But even this saying has crept in among Rasta-ish people, and we're here to put you on notice that this is not one of our sayings. This is one of their sayings. And a good example of how this saying gets you in trouble with Jah is Saul. Saul basically says he feared the people. Even though he's king, Yahweh made him king, not the people. You understand? Yahweh had Samuel to anoint him, not the people. But he feared the people, and he obeyed excuse me, their voice or what they willed, what they wanted. He did what they willed, do what thou wilt. He didn't do the will of our father, Jehovah's, and listen to the voice of the prophet. Now, therefore, I pray thee, Saul goes on in his abetuta, in his petition, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship Yahweh. Turn again with me that I may. So already showed he was out of the way. And you can tell in the language where he keeps saying the Lord thy God, not the Lord our God. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return. 
I will not return with thee. I will not repent with thee. I will not return with thee. For thou hast rejected the word of Yahweh. And Yahweh hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Has rejected you. Not the people. The people like Saul. You understand? Know but Yahweh did not. You understand? Know and Samuel turned about to go away. He was about to go away. He laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and rent and it rent. In other words, when 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 Samuel was about to leave, Saul grabbed hold on it. And this is why we said the Richard Gere, the Richard Gere movie is very interesting. The Richard Gere David movie, the one that he plays David in it. In the beginning, we see this scene, and it's a pretty good scene, if I recall it correctly. It's a pretty good scene. So check that out, Richard Gere as David, you know, as in the David movie. Pretty interesting, especially this first part, this first scene in the movie. So when Samuel's about to turn and go away, Saul laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and it ripped. Can you imagine he ripped the he ripped the priest, the high priest garment? Oh my goodness. You understand? I have no goodness but thou, Yahweh, but what did Samuel say to him? Yahweh, Jah hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day. He's ripped that. You rip my garment, nigga? He's ripped the kingdom from you, you understand, and have given it to a neighbor of thine. He's given it to one of your neighbors, right, that is better, that is better in Yahweh's sight than thou. You know who he's talking about. We know who he's talking about. Saul didn't really know. We know who he's talking about. He's talking about King David, great King David. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. The strength of Israel will neither lie nor repent. For he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, then, 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 then Saul said, he said, I have sinned. He's like, he's doing a lot of that, right? I have sinned, yet honor me now. What? Nigga, he didn't do no repentance. Saul thinks that, like a lot of people, we can say, I have sinned. And now honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord thy God. See, that's a, that's the third time he says, I believe the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul. So Samuel, you know, on, on, on this Next time, he, he, he turned again. He said, all right. And it says, and Saul worshipped, and Saul worshipped Yahweh. See, that was the role, the importance of the high priest. See, there was a certain importance of the high priest we need to understand in this relationship right here. Now, check this out. And we're going to conclude this chapter here. And this is going to be on a pep lesson because a gag is the Hebrew, a pep. And it says in verse 32, then said Samuel, bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Now, in the movie with Richard Gere, um, the, the Saul character seems to state like he's going to hook. Saul, the, the, the Saul character is like, yeah, we got the, uh, a pet, a gag, the king of the Amalekites, and I was holding him like for ransom or something. You know, like holding him as a hostage. This is what you see in that movie of Richard Gere. But now here in the scriptures, Samuel, then said Samuel, bring ye hither, bring him here, bring a gag, the king of the Amalekites here. And a guy came to him delicately. A guy, a, a pep was very, came to him, you know, he was scared. He was scared. He was real scared. And for good reason. Because Yahweh remembers what he did to our people. You understand? Know That's the same thing when you look at, at Gaddafi and you see those videos. And there seems to be a lot of different videos, a lot of different angles of it. But you look at it. Any, any one of it basically tells you he was scared. He, he, he comes out very delicately. You understand? Know all that braggadocia, all that cockiness is gone. You understand? He comes out very delicately. And just like a gag, a pep came out delicately, and a gag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. What? Are you serious? He says, Surely the bitterness of death is past. What does Samuel say? Samuel said, As thy sword hath made woman childless. As your sword has made woman childless, right, um, 
um, as your sword has made woman childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. It's just ironic, like also where, you know, he was in his hometown of Sirte as well, Gaddafi was. And Samuel hewed a gag in pieces before the Lord, before Yahweh, before Jah, if you please, in Gilgal. See, now Gilgal connection is very interesting. Stay tuned for we did a teaching on circumcision. Stay tuned for that circumcision teaching because Gilgal is the place where the Israelites were circumcised again, and it means rolling, or some even call it the place of foreskins, right? Then Samuel went to Ramah. He went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gebeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. In other words, Samuel didn't, didn't look at that look at look at um Saul again didn't see him again until after, uh, until the day of his death nevertheless Saul uh, nevertheless excuse me Samuel Samuel he mourned for Saul even though he didn't see Saul until the day of his death he still mourned for him you understand he had bitterness and heaviness of heart you understand because of the type of person that Saul was and Yahweh repenteth that he had made Saul king over Israel, that, that, that Yahweh had repented. Now, of course, in this very same chapter, he uses repent in a couple. It says Yahweh repented, he repented. And then in, in what uh, Samuel says in verse 29, it says also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. For he is not a man that he should repent. See, that's a part. There's, there's a little mishtir right there, and we might explain it, um, y'all willing, in another part. But what's so very interesting is the last part of this, the, uh, the uh, pep, you know, a gag. You understand? A gag who comes into the matrix of connection with, um, with uh, Gaddafi, and and what we have seen happen, especially the part where it talks about that, um, that, that a guy came to Saul, it says in the scripture, came to him, I think it uses uh, uh, delicately, delicately, let's find this verse right here and just hear the Amharic, so we're at verse 32, at the 32nd degree, right, so um, when we go to uh, chapter, what is it, chapter 15, and 32, right? It says, um, Besama Awa Wulu will manifest a Kudus, a Hadu, Amlak, Metafe, Samuela, Keramawi, Rafa, Asara, Mistam, Kutera, Salasa, who let Iska Macharasha, Iski Macharasha until the end. It says, Samuelim, Samuelim. Ya amalek in a nugusa gagina am to ling ale a gagema ietena kete kete what a rusu meta. Now, the the Amharic, the, the purified metaf kedus of nugus and the guest, here says a gagim and a gag ietena kete ketu shaking. Trembling. Isn't this what we see in the video concerning Gaddafi? In fact, Gaddafi is a perfect example, a, a kind of a visual example. Remember what the scripture says in the latter days? In the latter days, we will understand it perfectly. And now we look at that video, and the video is, is even, even not liking Gaddafi, is still very troubling. It, it, it's, it's very sad, but it's the justice that had to be done. For one who said no mercy to his own people, you understand, and was willing to even massacre and declare, I'm going to massacre this people and use everything I got to kill this people, his own people. You understand? So when, that's one of the few things, you know, Obama said that was right on the money when he said that just can't, you know, sit back when one says they're going to have no mercy on their own people. Because remember, mercy triumphs above, above judgment. That means one who has no mercy the scriptures say, the scriptures say, don't have no mercy, don't show them no mercy. 
And you see, so he couldn't have been shown mercy. And we see this example of that. So we can say Gaddafi, you know, saying, that he came delicately or more correctly, trembling. He came trembling. Agagim, and Agag said, he says, Bawunu, in truth, mot, death, in the Z, like this, Merara, in other words, it's like this bitter, Merara, no win. Is, is death really bitter like this? He must have known so. So when we look at the King James, King James says, Surely the bitterness of death is past. No. It's a question in them heart. This is what the half of the story. I'm happy that we're studying this right here because here that very same um, bitterness, surely the bitterness of death is past. Really, it should have been, in truth, is the bitterness of death really, is really like this? You understand? Is, in truth, is the bitterness of, is death, is death like this bitterness, or is the bitterness of death like this, in a sense? Samuelim, safe his etochina le jocha alba, in the derega chacho, in the who, and not his best etoch mecacala lij alba, to honalech ale. He says, and this is pretty correct according to the translation here, what we have at the 33, 33rd degree of this chapter. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made woman childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. Just like what you did, you made other women childless. You killed their children. Therefore, your mother shall be childless. You understand? Lij Alba, without child. Lij Alba. And then it goes on to say, Samuel Magaginna be egezi abi herrafita be gela gela quarareta. That he hewed him, he cut 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 him up. He cut him up. You understand? Now some people say, oh, that was so, God is love, so far. Well, God is love. True. John, Adonai, he is love. You understand? But he is just, he is just. You understand? No foolish love. You understand? No fool, fool love. You understand? No fool, fool love. So we wanted to touch on this part. We say it's coming to Arisha. So the last bait, the two verses, 34 and 35. Um, in the Milo. Samuel Lim Oda Aramati Mahede Sa O Lima Wada De Tu Awada Gib O Mwata Samuel Lima Iska Motebeta Kenadresa Sa O Lina Lema Yeta Dagmenya Alehedem Samuel Lima Lesa O Lale that Yahweh, the I am that I am in somewhere, it repented, it repented him that he had anointed. You understand? Know he had anointed. See, Yahweh is one with his righteous creatures. His righteous creatures become as his sons or daughters. So when it says that, that the strength, that Yahweh doesn't have to repent for nobody, but through his messenger, through his prophet, through the one who he has sent to deliver that, this is like when we said, and this helps us to even understand what we were feeling when we, before we put the video, um, and even after um, Sabbath Zakor or the Zakor Sabbath video where we talked about the connection between Amalek, you understand, between Haman and Gaddafi. And we've been discussing the metaphysical implications behind this matter. And this now would be the conclusion 
of this um, particular of, of, of this particular um, teaching. So our final word, well, we say the final word at this particular time on um, the killing or the, the, the murder of Gaddafi. Now you're going to have a lot of people back from him. Because remember what we said, Obama should be very kind of careful and find out who's who because there's some people who had business deals, some, some of the Americans over here, perhaps some of the Republicans too, who had sort of financial business deals with the Gaddafi regime. And then in mind that Gaddafi was persecuting his own people, that's why they wasn't so, 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 so hype, you understand, about doing anything about it. You understand? They were talking about, oh, these people are Al-Qaeda. Oh, these people are jihadists and so on and so on. And, and they're just being massacred like nothing. You know what I'm saying? And, and part of it also is that, that many of the white supremacy agents didn't want to go on. They, they saw that flag of the patriots who they call rebels. They really more should say that they're patriots. Now they can more or less say they're patriots. They saw that red, black, and green. And what Babylon and the rulers feared is that black people over here who also identify with that same red, black, and green, in a sense, might, you know, rise up in that sense. They might rise up, but instead what we're witnessing, and to their delight what they're witnessing is a lot of these so-called Pan-Africanists, you know, um, Afrocentric Pan-Africanists, you know, they're really lamenting for a lot of them are still lost. They don't really recognize what a what a what a threat, what a what a ill omen Gaddafi has been for the progress of Africa for the past um forty something years. In other words, because of ones like Gaddafi was the progressive efforts of his Imperial Majesty as well as the former king of um of uh, Libya, who fought against Mussolini and the fascists and the and, and the European colonizers, whom Gaddafi overthrew. This king was King Idris. But notice the interesting thing. Ask, ask the some of your Mohammedan, or you could look this up on the internet. Idris, the name Idris, actually means. Notice this. Literally, it means to study. Literally, Idris in the Arabic, it means to study. But as a, a name of a person, Idris is the name of Enoch, is the name of Enoch. In other words, in Arabic and in, in Mohammedanism and Islam, they call Enoch Idris. Idris is the Arabic and Mohammedan Islamic name for Enoch. And it was that king of Libya that he overthrew, and he overthrew the red, black, and green flag. So I don't know how these ones, some of these Afro-Americans will talk about, you know, some of these Afrocentric and pseudo-Pan-Africans can wave the red, black, and green flag in good conscience. See, something they don't know. And hopefully, my brothers and sisters, one would check this out and pass this on and, and don't have to agree with us, but study these things that we're saying. You understand? And find out the half of the story that you, that you don't know. So though this is not the end of the struggle, because the struggle still goes on, it is a positive sign here in the first 10, 11 years of the so-called, quote, new millennium or new age. And this is not one of the things that Babylon or the Illuminati or the Freemasons or whatnot completely has a grasp of. Don't believe the hype. Of course, you're going to get some conspiracy theorist videos that go out there and say, oh, this is a part of the, cons this is a part of Illuminati has engineered this, you know. Sometimes they overhype, you know, they overhype the enemy. But then, you know, they, that is the so-called art of war, ain't it? Anyway, my brothers and sisters, I love you because you love to study this word of our Father, and our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, Getachin Yesus Christos. If this message or any of these messages have been helpful, please support this effort with either your tithe or donation or support or your prayers. You understand? Whatever positive you can give to support this work, it could just be a, a positive word. 
You understand? Post up these videos. Feel free to post them up elsewhere. You understand? We're living in the last days of the old system and on the dawn of the new. My brothers, watch and pray. Watch and pray, my brothers. And I love you all in the name of the King of Kings and His Christ, Getachinam, and Hanitachin, Jesus Christos. And to my brothers, Shalom, Ras Tefari. This is your brother, Wendem Yadom, Ras Yadinos Tefari. Shalom.